fun thing for me, so, so three years ago, plus one week, so I guess that's two years and 51 weeks ago, um, I was, me and, and my husband, we flew, flew here for the on-campus interview for the Dean of, of Engineering position. So it was one week after Winter Carnival and all the snow statues were still in really pristine condition. And it was, I was just, it was like walking around in a fairyland because these statues, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I promise, I'm, and I'm gonna have my team help me. I'll have a, a, a several slides from some of the statues to give you an idea of the magnitude of these the, these sculptures. Uh, statues, no, you got to call them statues here. Um, they're but they're they're. I mean, some of them are 20, 30 feet high. I mean, they're they're some of them, and there's so much detail. Uh, and they're in, exquisitely creative and beautiful, and the students have a lot of fun doing them together as teams. So. All right, so I will have a few slides next time, but this is Winter Carnival Week. So what that means is students have Thursday and Friday off, no classes and no extra work piled on them that weekend. Um, and uh, that's that's supposed to be true. So um, this the interesting thing about, it, about um, Winter Carnival is that we only have 96 inches of snow to date right now. Um, so it's kind of an interesting time, uh, you know, but still, I'm seeing a whole bunch of beautiful statues made out of clean snow somehow, so it's impressive. All right, so I think it's time to get started. I'm gonna, um, I am going to share my screen and show a couple slides, and then I'm gonna introduce this evening's speakers. And while I'm doing that, I want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Janet Callahan. I am um, Dean of the College of Engineering uh oh, I don't think I have the right thing going here. All right, hang on. <clears throat> I have another link I need to find. Um, here we go. All right, my name is Janet Callahan. I'm Dean of the College of Engineering at Michigan Technological University, which is located in Houghton, Michigan, which is in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And it's really hard to do this when you, you know, when you can't see which way your hands are going, but the upper peninsula of Michigan is pretty far north. Uh, and it usually there's a I don't know, two or three, 250 inches of snow or at least 200 inches of snow. So we've been talking about the um, snow shortfall and winter carnival. So Husky Bites are every Mondays at six, uh, um, uh, featuring a whole host of different topics. Tonight's, um, tonight's Husky Bites is sponsored by Jerry Goodwin. Thank you, Jerry. All sponsorships, 100% of the money goes to student scholarships across the entire university. And I want to thank Gregory's who are matching up to $25,000 of gifts toward the annual scholarship fund. Thank you again. If you're interested in giving our sponsoring, go to that page, but also just drop an email quickly to engineering at mtu.edu so we know um, how you would like your sponsorship to be designated. We're also live streaming and we, we have a whole bunch of people who join us through live stream and, and it's wonderful to see, uh, see that. We're going to do a quick poll um, just to see who's with us this evening. Uh, you know, we get a combination of students, um, students who are, pre, I would say, pre-college, meaning that they, um, you know, are just possibly future students. We have a lot of alumni who attend and alumni. We have um, faculty and staff. We have friends of Michigan Tech, and we have curious people who join us. And so. I believe you can see this poll as it's going and we've already got um, 87 people here and uh, we have about 75% alumni uh, alumni this evening and we have about 7% Michigan students and the next highest category is curious people. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to come together every Monday night. This is the second of 12 different um, webinars. Uh, this is the spring season of Husky Bites. All right, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So this is the lineup um, of, of uh, the next talks. Uh, there's a, gonna be a really interesting um, talk on snow. Let's hope it snows by next week. Uh, um, Russ Al Alger is gonna be speaking uh, and uh, with co-host Toby Kunari. Um, uh, Russ is a very interesting person who's done a whole bunch of things involving building roads with snow and much more. 
And then we have a whole bunch of things. We, we are taking a break one month from today, which is March 1st. There'll be no session that week. I've already stated this. Um, so send an email to engineeringmtu.edu if you're interested in sponsoring webinar. And this is Russ, uh, who we're looking forward to hearing from next week. And so I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and, and so um, Jeremy, you can, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. So that's all set up. And, and right now, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce co-host Dr. Roger Guillory, who um, uh, earned his Bachelor of Science uh, in, in biomedical engineering in 2016 here uh, from Michigan Tech. He then went on to earn his PhD also from here, uh, which he earned in a swift three degrees, earning it in 2019. He then went on to do a postdoc, which is um, after you earn your PhD, that's called your doctoral degree. You can then do a postdoc, which is um, kind of like a, an additional research opportunity. He did that um, at Northwestern. Uh, and then he joined us fall of 2020 as an assistant professor back at his alma mater. So Roger, the interesting thing about Roger is he's originally from Texas. And when I learned that, I was I was I was actually so delighted. Uh, and um, he loves to fish. Uh, uh, he came here because he was he wanted a little adventure, and I hope he sure got a whole bunch of it. And also as a result of a really influential um, college coordinator um, from high school, who um, whose name is Pamela Williams. And so uh, he just wanted to acknowledge her influence on his life. Roger also likes cooking. And I will say no more, Roger, but leave it up to you to introduce Dr. Jeremy Goldman. Dr. Guillory. All right. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. So uh, today, I'll be introducing our speaker, Professor Goldman. Uh, Professor Goldman received his PhD in biomedical engineering from Northwestern University in 2002. Upon graduation, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship under the direction of Melody Swartz at the Swiss Federal Polytechnic Institute in Biological and Chemical Engineering. He began a tenure track assistant professor position here at Michigan Tech in 2004. In 2017, he was promoted to the rank of full professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Professor Goldman's extremely productive research career has afforded him with prestigious research funding from the National Institutes of Health the American Heart Association, and the Fulbright Scholars Program. He has authored and co-authored over 60 scientific manuscripts, publishing in top-tier biomedical science and material science engineering journals, such as Circulation Research, the American Journal of Physiology, Active Biomaterialia, and Advanced Healthcare Materials. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Goldman as our speaker today. Thank you very much, Roger, for that introduction. And uh, thank you all participants for coming to virtually watch my, my uh, webinar on treating arterial disease. So as Dr. Uh, Guillory mentioned, I'm a professor in the biomedical engineering department. I've been working closely over the past 12 years or so with a collaborator in the uh, materials uh, science and engineering department, uh, Dr. Jaroslaw Dralik, to develop biodegradable stents. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about arterial disease and stents in general. And then I'm gonna show you some of our work with biodegradable stent development. So here you can see a cartoon illustration of a heart. Our hearts have four coronary arteries. Two are shown here on the front side and there are two more on the back side. These arteries are prone to progressive stenosis development termed atherosclerosis. If the stenosis develops enough, it can block the flow of blood and cause a heart attack, which permanently kills part of the cardiac tissue. Here, so here you can see a cartoon blow up of a region of one coronary artery. And you're being shown the progressive buildup of plaque at, the, that, at that location of the artery. This process of progressive buildup can take many decades to reach a dangerous level. So what is the plaque made up of? Well, there is a large component of cholesterol and extracellular matrix proteins, but there is also a large cellular component the smooth muscle cells that are normally resident in the arterial wall, in the medial layer of the artery, become activated during atherosclerosis to migrate into the intima of the artery, where they begin to proliferate and secrete extracellular matrix to grow tissue. So you can see that on the, uh, in the cartoon illustration on the left, you can see this process, and this is known as neointimal hyperplasia. 
neo intimo because the cells are generating a new intima and hyperplasia because the cells are excessively proliferating. And you can see cross sections of actual arteries on the right side depicting this process. For the top image, you can see a healthy artery. That's the arterial wall and cross section. Uh, you can see the wide open lumen. That's this white feature here where there's no tissue. That's where the blood would flow. The lumen is this, so the lumen is this white region in the interior of the cross section. And in the bottom image, uh, you can see lots of new tissue has, has grown and the lumen has become quite restricted. So you can see the, 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 the space here that's left for the blood flow has become quite restricted. And so if you compare the top and the bottom images, you can see that the space for blood flow to pass through the artery at this point has been severely compromised. And a human with this artery might feel shortness of breath and difficulty or pain with strenuous activity because there is a large reduction in the flow rate that, of blood that can be pushed across this type of stenosis. Fortunately, there are a number of very good surgical options to treat atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. One is known as CABBAGE, which is an acronym for coronary artery bypass grafting. This is depicted on the left. A cartoon illustration is shown of a heart with two stenosed coronary arteries. And you can see the stenoses over here and over here, and they're blown up over here and over here. Uh, this can be treated by harvesting the saphenous vein from the leg of the patient shown here. The saphenous vein is taken from the leg of the patient and grafting it from the aortic arch to a point downstream of the stenosis. Generally, at least one of the diseased arteries will be bypassed with an internal mammary artery. You can see that depicted over here. Or it's also known as an IMA, uh, an acronym for internal mammary artery. And that's taken from the, from the uh, chest just from one side, from the side of the artery that's um, implanted in the chest wall, that's cut and it's dropped down to a point distal of, the, of, of a different uh, stenosed artery. And you can see that, you can see that uh, shown, and then grafting shown over here. So as you might expect, uh, the IMA is better suited as an artery than the saphenous vein because it has been designed by nature to function in the arterial environment. And uh, further on the right, we can see the process of a coronary artery being treated with a stent. The first stent, the, the first step is positioning the stent crimped balloon tip catheter at the proper side of the artery. And the balloon is pressurized. You can see that inflation step over here. And uh, that, that uh, uh, inflation of the balloon expands and deploys the stent against the, the wall of the artery and the plaque and forces that open. And then the balloon is deflated and withdrawn leaving the stent in place to provide mechanical support. And over the past 15 years or so, it has become routine to deliver anti-proliferative drugs to the artery from the stent uh, platform by means of a drug coating. The addition of a drug coating was made necessary by the unfortunate frequent occurrence of restenosis by intimal hyperplasia. So restenosis refers to the reocclusion of the artery. And this second stenosis development proceeds much more rapidly than the first one that was originally treated by the stent. But once again, the smooth muscle cells are typically the main culprit. And so here we have a poll question. So I want you to look at these cross sections. These are cross sections of arteries that have been stented. And you can see the wide open lumen, right? Just like you saw in a previous um, slide. And here you can see the neointimal hyperplasia tissue and you can see the uh, restricted opening of the, of the lumen. And I want you, to, I'm just asking just to help you get oriented. What do you think these uh, black structures are in the images? So what do you think? What are those strange black rectangles? Where do they come from? All right, and so the question is, what are the strange black rectangles? And the four possible choices are, A, the result of too much metal in a person's diet, B, structures that grow in the artery, due to some something. C, these are the stent struts in cross section. Uh, and then D, these are normal structures that are found in all arteries. So, so B was structures that grow in the artery due to stent placement. Right. All right, and so, um, so we've got a whole bunch of people answering the polls live and we're seeing an overwhelming response C. Right, that's the correct one. So very good. These are the stent struts in cross sections. So the, those pieces of metal, when you cut them this way, you, you end up seeing their images. 
uh, in cross section. Mm -hmm. Right. What, so keep, can... what keeps them open? Like after they're expanded, after the balloon expands them, what keeps them open? What Dr. keeps the stand open? Yeah. So the stand, so the stand uh, has ductility and strength, and so it can it can be open to a variety of different diameters and hold that position with strength due to its uh, mechanical properties. Okay. All right. And here, you can see, because of the issue raised on the previous slide about restenosis, the, um, uh, there, was a, there was an addition of a, a drug coating was made necessary by this, uh, the frequent occurrence of restenosis by entomal hyperplasia. And <clears throat> generally, generally, these coatings are added by uh, spread deposition of polymer layers on the side of the stent facing the artery. That's the abluminal side. And you can see in this image the polymer present, uh, presence on one side of the uh, of this strut. Here you can see that everyone can see my cursor, right? Okay, so you yep. can see the polymer. You're, you're seeing a strut here in this uh, scanning electron uh, microscope. Unfortunately, the drug that's released from the polymer coating uh, blocks all ci all cell types from proliferating, not just the smooth muscle cells. So, um, entomal hyperplasia and restenosis is primarily a problem of the smooth muscle cells and the, the drug that's um, added to the stents is very effective at blocking the proliferation of smooth muscle cells, but all cell types are also blocked. So for instance, endothelial cells, which are normally important for protecting the arterial surface from blood, blood clots, among other functions, are um, the drug therapy from the stent has the unintended side effect of delaying or preventing the endothelial cells from proliferating and restoring their cell layer after their injury from the stent deployment. So uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, inhibition of the endothelial cell proliferation increases the likelihood for blood clots to develop on the stent surface, and that's known as thrombosis. So, so please keep in mind that an optimal cellular outcome following stent deployment is that the smooth muscle cells are inhibited from proliferating excessively uh, to prevent new enthalmal hyperplasia around the stent, while the endothelial cells must be able to proliferate so they can fully and quickly regenerate their protective layer around the stent. So I'm just I'm just gonna like I'm just gonna make fun of your um of all the jargon. I'm following it because I was actually in a startup company in this area, but it you know it's fun. It's so so those of you who are lost in jargon, that's what you learn when you major in biomedical engineering. You learn the jargon of your field, and it's awfully fun to be able to understand, you know, understand the jargon, you know what I mean? To understand um, through the jargon, I guess is what I'm saying, but no. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm trying my best to simplify it, so. You're doing good, you're doing good. It's just fun, it's fun to listen. Yeah, so the smooth muscle cells are the cells that are in the artery wall. They're like the contractile cells and uh, the endothelial cells are the cells that coat the surface of the blood vessel. So the endothelial cells, from the, from the standpoint of the stent and restenosis, the endothelial cells are good cells, and the smooth cells are, just from that standpoint, are bad cells. I mean, obviously that's a very gross oversimplification. And the, uh, the drug that's um, incorporated into the polymer coatings on the stent blocks the proliferation of all, just generically blocks, not specifically blocks all cell proliferation, and that's a problem because we need the endothelial cells. So, and hopefully we'll have time to come, to come back to that, to that later. I have, if I have more time. So, um, so the fully biodegradable stent concept came into play with these challenges in mind. It was thought that since the presence of the stent promoted into hyperplasia and that therapies, therapies to combat this problem caused additional complications, perhaps it would be better if we could simply make sense that self removed after the artery had healed. And this exciting idea has turned out to be a major challenge that has not yet been solved. So here you can see a number of different kinds of biodegradable stents that have been developed over the past decade or so. The first fully biodegradable stents were made of polymers, but these failed spectacularly in human trials. And then came a fully biodegradable metal stents based on magnesium. And the first three, the first three um, stents in the top left shown here are magnesium-based stents. And these are getting better all the time, particularly the magnesium-based stents are getting better all the time, but have not yet succeeded in clinical trials. And a part of the problem is that, is that there's a moving target, which is that um, wh while we're in the process of developing biodegradable stents, the, uh, the conventional stent technology is also improving. 
All right, good. So everyone's already getting getting started on the poll question. So we've got a poll question which asks, um, you know, what's the biggest problem with polymer stents relative to metal stents? And so we've got too expensive, scarcity of materials, low mechanical strength, challenging to predict degradation mechanism and products, and not nice and shiny like metals. <laughs> no one's picking that one. I know. I, I would just like just looking at the. I would go for the longest one. Just somehow an instinct is pointing me toward D, right. like a, a like a test taker yeah. instinct. Yeah. So should I answer the question then? Yes. So, well, and and that seems to be the most popular choice as well. Yeah. So I so I tricked them all to guess the the correct answer is the low mechanical strength. So the polymers stents, uh, the plastic has has no. There's no way to make the polymers strong as strong as metals. So the, the clinicians are used to using metal stents and then they switch to biodegradable polymer stents and uh, the polymers just aren't strong enough. And they, so they need to have thicker struts, they need to have strange uh, lock, interlocking mechanisms to help compensate for the, the lack of strength. And this, this was the, the main issue with, the main problem with the stents. So they create better, they create stronger, in, uh, more severe injuries when they're deployed. Um, there's a larger surface for uh, thrombosis to occur. Um, and so D, uh, challenging to predict degradation mechanism products, actually it's not, it's actually more challenging for the metal stents to predict that. So the polymers are typically, the polymer stents are typically made for, uh, from materials that have been uh, well worked out many decades ago and are well characterized polymers and they have very simple degradation mechanisms, very straightforward. And they are, they're, um, they're the same in vitro or in vivo, meaning they're same on the bench top versus in the body, but the metals, it turns out they have all kinds of different products depending upon their conditions, and they can be very different from the bench top to the body. So it became much. It's very complicated to um, uh, investigate the uh, degradation mechanism and products of are much more complicated to do that for metals versus the polymers. Okay. So, um, so my team came on the scene then around this time about twelve years ago. And actually, we started out as a SMU design team sponsored by Boston Scientific. They wanted us to find a way to help them predict in vivo performance of biodegradable metals from in vitro data. So taking the in vitro data shown in this like tri uh, an inverted triangle, all the different in vitro tests or benchtop tests, and then we want to go and select a material and fabricate a stent because that's the, that's the goal. And we want to go do that quickly, and we want to go then go into the... Um, into the uh, a, a pig implantation of, of actual stents. And that turns out to be, to be very expensive. So uh, at the time that we, we were uh, looking at this problem and Boston Scientific approached us, engineers were doing their development of materials on the bench top, right? They were getting this type of data and then they were making decisions about which materials should be manufactured into stents for the pig implantation studies. And they, they were having troubles, they were having trouble with the relationship. So we were tasked with trying to find a way to relate the two and to two together. Okay, so you could make a better material selection decision. Um, so instead of making this great leap of faith, right, we wanted to have a way to be over here where we have some type of bridge between the in vitro side of thing and the pig side, side of, the, of the equation. Okay, so that's where we came in. And uh, we knew we needed to, we knew that the solution was gonna be in vivo. It wasn't going to be in vitro because in vitro was too far removed and the metal was too comp complex and the in vivo environment was too complex to replicate in vitro. Um, but we didn't want to be using a stent geometry, a, a stent starting geometry. So we needed a simplified geometry and we wanted to be able to implant into a rat or a mouse. So what we decided during this, during this project was to reduce the risk with a low cost and simplified rat based model where we implanted a wire of the selected material instead of a stent. Essentially, we were implanting a stent strut into the, arteri into the artery instead of, a, instead of a full stent. So that was a simplification. We were in vivo, but we were in a small animal and we had a wire instead of a stent. So that, that reduced the cost and the time and the skill actually also required for that. So, but a lot of valuable information can be collected from a wire implant that can help us make decisions about which material should, uh, should proceed to stent testing. Uh, for instance, we can characterize the biological response uh, of the arterial cells to material. Uh, so we could learn if there's a toxic response or there's other, some other type of failure mode. And we can collect the, in, the implant at different uh, post-implant time, time points 
and, and characterize the implant to learn about the, the corrosion behavior mechanism and rate. Okay, so this is, this is just a snapshot of the surgical procedure. And I, I just wanna go through quickly because I'm running out of time, but here's the artery and you can see some vascular clamps that just uh, temporarily block the blood flow. And then we poke the wire through the artery from the outside in, and then we advance it through the lumen of the artery and then we poke it out the other side. That's, that's not shown in this, in this image. And then we can just leave the wire there and we remove the clamps, restore blood flow and allow the animal to recover for up, up to a, a year and a half. And uh, the surgical procedure is so simple that all the students that want to learn that uh, procedure can learn it. Okay. Take your time, Jeremy, because we, you know, every single speaker has run over massively. And so you can be just- Oh, good. That's know. good. And I'm, 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 I'll calm down. So we have another, another question. So um, I showed you on a previous slide that there was a company developing magnesium stents. There also, there has been interest in, and there's still academic interest in developing iron stents. So what do you think might happen to an iron material that's corroding in the artery. If you had to predict, can we get can we get the pull the pull back? All right, that's going to come up soon. So um, iron corrosion will exhibit the following feature. So first of all, iron ions will leave the implant and enter the surrounding fluid, allowing the implant to slowly dissolve, like a pellet of sugar or salt placed in a glass of water. Or B, small pieces of corroding iron metal will break off from the implant as the implant slowly breaks into fragments. Or C, the iron implant will corrode into a product that expands and increases the effective size of the implant, like rust on a car. Ooh, the, you're a tricky um, professor question yeah. asker. Yeah. That's what my students say. They don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I, I have a PhD in this area and I know a lot about the field. I'm not sure what the answer is. Yeah, Dr. Gilley told me this is not a fair question. He said, this is too hard. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't think, yeah. But this, Gosh, I don't even want to guess. It'll display my ignorance. But you're hidden. You'll be hidden. You don't know who, the, uh, who, who selected which one. Well, and so B is the more popular answer, which is small pieces of corroding metal will break off from the implant as the, slowly, as mm -hmm. the implant slowly breaks into fragments. Yeah. So, so the answer, what's the answer? The answer is C. A disappointing, <laughs> the, the iron stent rusts like, like a car. So you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound like a good thing for a stent to do, right? Like an iron stent will rust. Well, what does that mean in an artery, right? We don't like it when it happens on our car, right? But the whole idea of, a, of an iron stent would be to make it go away, right? So uh, the rust on a car makes the, that part of the car go away, right? So is it okay? So that's, that was the question. And so we took a look at that. And actually we took a look at this with the, um, with the um, rat model. So here you can see the corrosion behavior of iron on the left and magnesium on the right. And these wires, as I mentioned, were collected from rat arteries at the indicated times. Uh, and uh, the wire in panel A over here shows what the iron wire looked like prior to implantation. The magnesium wire looked very similar to that. And for each material, you can see some discoloration post-implantation. And the iron implant here, you can see, produces an expansive rust product. The magnesium implant, conversely, um, it produces a, a whitish product and degrades, you can see, within the original implant geometry. So um, the magnesium mode of corrosion is actually preferred. And I'll show you a slide in a little bit to explain why. Um, unfortunately, there is a substantial loss of magnesium metal at just 32 days. So this is three months over here versus, and it, it maintained its strength very nicely off at three months for iron. But magnesium loses strength very quickly and loses material even at, at as early as one month post-implantation. And a stent needs to remain mechanically functional for between one to two years. So magnesium mm. isn't going to get you very far. And the industry is, is well aware of this problem and has been feverishly processing and alloying magnesium in sophisticated ways to squeeze out as much time as they can to prolong the degradation of magnesium as, as much as possible. Okay. So here on the left is a cross section and uh, of a rat artery. And you can see the arterial wall here. And it had a high purity iron wire as an implant. And that's depicted by this green uh, dashed circle. That's where the, uh, the iron wire originally was. And you can see the voluminous iron oxide product, which is what happens when iron rusts. So is that okay? Well, we looked at this and thought about it for quite a, time, quite, quite a long time. And uh, so one thing you can see from the cross section is that this iron corrosion product has pushed away the arterial tissue, okay? 
and it's restricted the uh, cross-sectional area of the lumen, which is where blood flows. So the iron corrosion uh, process wasn't, wasn't, a, wasn't a good thing for the function of the artery because the product accumulated. It accumulated, it was very stable, and, uh, and it restricted the size of the lumen. So these are the kinds of events we look for in these histological stains to try to predict how a stent made from this implant material might perform in a pig or a human artery. And on the right side, we collected a number of high purity magnesium implants from the right artery over a period of 32 days. And what you're looking at are cross sections of the implant itself imaged under a scanning electron microscope in what's known as backscatter mode. And this allows us to identify the pure metal as the bright feature and the corrosion product as the darker feature in each, uh, in each uh, metal cross section. And you can appreciate that the, the pure metal reduces in size and the corrosion product increases in size over time. And much of the implant has been completely solubilized in 32 days, which is what we saw before. So uh, once again, we can contrast iron and magnesium corrosion. Iron corrosion product is expansive and stable and magnesium corrosion takes place within the original geometry of the implant. And at least some of the product is not particularly stable. Okay, so here, um, so here we can see that um, a, a different type of response to the iron implant. On the left side, we see that the rat artery has experienced what we call, what we call intimal hyperplasia, which is what you've seen before. And this occurred in a section of the iron wire that resisted corrosion. So there's not a whole lot of rust over here on this, on this wire. And this, the iron wire was over here where the yellow arrow is pointing and it just shifted down due to the uh, cross-sectioning process. So it was originally over here uh, against, the, against the artery wall. And then this intimal hyperplasia formed around it over nine months. Mm. And uh, so variability in corrosion behavior for different materials is also something we're interested in measuring. And on the right side, we have a polymer coated zinc metal that we evaluated in the rat artery. And you can also see uh, a lot of intimal hyperplasia and a, a reduction of the cross-sectional area for the lumen in, the, in this cross-section also. And um, we've, we've discovered also, we've also discovered other failure modes for different biodegradable metals, but these two images highlight what a conventional failure mechanism looks like in the rat model. Okay, and then so, um, so on the topic of zinc, which was one of the materials I showed you on the previous slide, we began implanting zinc wires into rat arteries around a decade ago, and we were quite surprised by what we found. So at the top, our scanning electron microscope images of the implant cross sections showing a mild and uniform attack, uh, corrosion attack on the implant surface. One of the three months, month uh, implants was removed intact, and that's shown below. And we can see a localized white corrosion uh, product that's forming. And uh, we were encouraged by this result because the corrosion product was not expansive, as we saw with iron. The corrosion was not overly rapid, as we found with magnesium. And the zinc seemed to combine the beneficial aspects of both iron and magnesium, being slow to corrode and generating compact uh, product layers. And the behavior that we saw over three months progressed, progressed up through six months. We saw a more severe progressive corrosion and more localized white features on the wire. And uh, this is what we were hoping for, as the uh, pure metal was steadily reduced over time, as would be required for a biodegradable metal stent, but it was slowly, it was happening slowly. So we were very encouraged by this. And um, uh, of course, our goal is to make stents. And here you can see a stent that we made. And uh, I'm interested in the neointimal responses, uh, the, the mechanisms of neointimal responses and the biological effects of material modifications. And so why might we need to modify the metal through alloying and processing? Uh, because the mechanical properties of the pure metal are not adequate for the stenting application. But each time we modify the metal, the biocompatibility changes and the biological response needs to be characterized again. So ultimately, I'd like to, ultimately I'd like to determine if there are patterns between modifications and biological responses. And so clarifying these relationships May, might allow us to predict the outcomes of metallurgical modifications and design better implant materials. And the bioactivity of the corrosion byproducts is also in, in, of interest to me. Uh, so as the metal implant corrodes, in addition to forming insoluble products that you've seen in some of the uh, cross sections of the metal under scanning electron micrographs, um, there's also a soluble product and that's usually uh, metal ions that are released into surrounding tissue. And these metal ions can enter cells and bind proteins 
uh, thereby changing their functions. And so we found something that was very interesting uh, very early on when we were implanting these high purity uh, zinc uh, wires into the rat arteries. So uh, what we found very generally was that the smooth muscle cells that normally form excessively around the implant materials and form a new intimal tissue, they were not present near the zinc implant. Um, so even though some new intimal tissue forms around the implant over time, it's deficient in smooth muscle cells. And this is very clear and reproducible in the, uh, in the wire model. So let me show you some of this. So um, I'll try to be very general about this. So this is, the, this is a, um, a fluorescence image of a cross section. And this is a, a tissue that's stained with a dye that makes all the cell nuclei appear blue, bluish. So you can see all these little blue dots are cell nuclei. And the wire was over here. You can't see that in this image, but it was over here. And this is the arterial wall, right? So this is the area that's the lumen, luminal area, right? This is where the wire is. And this tissue, this is the neointhymal tissue that grew around the wire. And we were very interested in inspecting that tissue, what type of cells are present there, in particular smooth muscle cells, because those are the main culprit for a failure of, uh, of these uh, stent materials. But when we looked specifically for that cell type, which we can do by fluorescent labeling of those cells. So the green here in this image, it's the same tissue, just under a different fluorescent light, so the same location, right, from the top and bottom. And here you can see the new intimal tissue is outlined by this red line. So you can see it, but it's just overlaid with where you see the cell nuclei here. So this tissue here, these cell nuclei are actually right over here. Um, there are no positive smooth muscle cells in this tissue. The smooth muscle cells are in the arterial wall as they should be, right? You can see the green in the arterial wall, but there are none in the, in the um, uh, new intima around the zinc which was very exciting because normally that those cells should predominate in the new intima. So, and uh, we saw that in other, other uh, visualizations here too. We did the same thing on a different cross section of a different implant of, of zinc. And we looked at this case, the, the smooth muscle cells are the red cells, right? And we saw smooth muscle cells in, in, in this tissue, but they were, they were on the out, outer perimeter of the tissue. On the inside of the tissue, we didn't see the smooth muscle cells. So we thought, well, this is very intriguing. It looked like zinc was actively suppressing the effect of the, uh, the, the, the normal activation of the smooth muscle cells. So remember, in a conventional stent, the smooth muscle cells are the predominating uh, cell type that promote the failure of the stent through intimal hyperplasia and restenosis by growing tissue around the stent struts and gradually occluding the lumen. And this is this was such a, a major problem for stents that the stents had to be coated with a polymer that released drugs to block the uh, proliferation of those cells. But then by, by, with that solution of adding the drug, they created a new problem because they blocked all the cells. They blocked the endothelial cells that, which are needed, right? So here we have a zinc implant and as it degrades, as it's breaking down, it's essentially, in our, in our view, releasing a drug, which is the zinc, the zinc ions, which mm -hmm. enter into the cells and the smooth muscle cells are suppressed by the zinc influx, the ionic zinc influx. And this was not just seen in the wire model, but in, the, in this uh, uh, image in the center, another group looked at pure zinc stents in rabbits. They put the pure zinc stents into rabbits and they looked at this very, in a very similar way they made a, made a stain for the smooth muscle cells, just like us, but here it shows up brown, right? So the smooth muscle cells show up brown. You can see them in the arterial wall. This is where the stent strut would be in cross section. And this is the tissue that's growing around the stent, just like we have tissue that grows around the wire. And um, you can see that there's no brown signal, right, in the vicinity directly at the interface of the stent, right, of the zinc stent strut. So the smooth muscle cells are all around, but they don't go near the stent strut. And that, protects against the excessive activity of the muscle cells. At the same time, we looked for endothelialization, right? Remember the endothelial cells are an important cell type that we want to regenerate. We don't want to block those cells. And that can be done with an antibody that binds to CD31 as a receptor in the endothelial cells. This is used to type endothelial cells. And you can see the brown, they should be, endothelial cells should be on the surface of the, of the blood vessel. They should be on the surface of the neointhymal tissue. And you can see regeneration of this brown signal and it strengthens over time. And gradually between six and 12 months, it's, it's a very strong signal, right? 
a very strong cover. So those stents are covered with endothelial cells, but the muscle cells are blocked. So it looked like zinc had this very nice property of blocking the muscle cells, but um, allowing the endothelial cells to regenerate. And in addition, zinc was a nice uh, middle ground between iron and magnesium because it had it combined the best corrosion behavior of both metals. So, and then we saw this very interesting uh, property of zinc. And later on, actually, Dr. Guillory did the work to show that it was to prove that it was ionic zinc that actually exerted this effect on this on the smosa cells. Well, I'm I'm yeah. going to interrupt for a second because I can see Guillory. Our, our co-host, Dr. Guillory, assistant professor at Michigan Tech, is a co-author on a paper published in 2015, but he didn't graduate with his Bachelor of Science degree until 2016. So this means he was already in your lab for several years doing undergraduate research. Yeah. And to, so, to be one of two, you know, you know, to be the second author on a paper like that, this is this is what I think. Um, I think what I think it's one of the characteristic features of Michigan Tech is that if you're interested in doing this kind of thing, you're going to find a professor to align your passion with. So nice job, nice job, nice work as an undergraduate, Roger. So, absolutely. So that's that's exactly what we try to do. And uh, and Dr. Gilder is doing that as a professor too. He's getting um, excited and highly motivated undergrads into his lab and they do they can do a lot of work and they can learn the surgeries they can learn all the all the all the uh, processing characterization techniques and they can put together figures they can learn how to use all the microscopes and they can put together uh, the figures and they can even they can even begin to learn to write papers and um, some of them become quite advanced and um, uh, yeah so Dr. Gillard went through that process and he was he was obviously a very exceptional undergraduate student. And I convinced him to stay for his doctoral work, and he stayed with me also for his doctoral work. Doctoral work. So, so most of the images, um, most of the work on zinc, um, since since around that time, since around like 2014, 2015, was um, um, involved Dr. Gillery in one fashion or another. Usually, usually as as a leading uh, scientist on the, as a, as a student scientist. So I think I'll stop. I think I'll stop here. Then there's more, uh, but I think I would. I'll end up taking. I can end up taking a lot of time, and maybe maybe it's a good idea to go for questions. So um, I encourage everyone to load your questions up in the Q and A. I can see there's a bunch of questions there, and and Roger's going to um, answer some questions himself, and and uh, and and also in conjunction with Dr. Goldman. Um, while you're loading up your questions, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, I want to especially thank um, Dr. Goldman and Dr. Guillory for their time this evening. It's, it's been wonderful to learn about this work. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, um, you know, as a remark from me, you know, it's interesting because iron, right? We know that iron's present in our body. Magnesium, yeah, we know magnesium present in our body and zinc, right? So these are, we're, we're sort of like, Good selections of choice, and it's very it's very dramatic to me what I'm noticing the difference between these three materials relative to behavior in the body. It's 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 you know I almost want to suggest like galvanized iron or something like that, but I know that's a bad idea because finally the zinc will finish up and then the iron will start corroding like crazy. But I'm, this is a fascinating field to me. I've always been fascinated by the intersection of science with with them. Um, with medicine. And uh, so if, if you too are fascinated by this topic area, um, one of the engineering majors you can select is called biomedical engineering. And so this is an example of a biomedical engineering project featuring metals, which is also an historic strength here at Michigan Tech, which was founded uh, you know, to train mining engineers back when copper was discovered in the, in the, in the area. So thank you again, um, speakers for, for your expertise and, and thank you audience for joining us. This is um, Michigan Tech's Husky Bytes series and I'm Janet Callahan, the Dean of the College of Engineering. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Roger and Jeremy to start answering some of these really cool questions I'm seeing. No problem. And I, and I guess I kind of wanna start uh, also by commenting on, on what you just said because you actually uh, bring up a really good point. You know, these metals that 
um, are commonly used for uh, degradable metal implants are uh, in some way or form related to uh, metals that are used in our body. And, and that's a, a really a critical concept in the use of degradable metals. It would make sense, right, to try to use a material that, you know, has some function or has some form in the body. You know, that, that would make a lot of sense to do. So, uh, and, and that's also uh, kind of the, the genesis of this strategy as well. Um, you know, in the beginning, you can start and you can say, well, we need a material that can undergo some corrosive or corrosion, biocorrosion process, um, but also one that could be in, you know, new word here, biocompatible. And, you know, the natural starting place are uh, materials that, you know, can be found in the body itself. Magnesium, uh, which was a really early term, uh, great starting place. Uh, was a is a metal ion that exists in uh, in cells and your in your uh, your fluid uh, very abundantly. It's in really high concentrations. It's used for many physiologic processes. So it was quite obvious to try to start with certain materials such as this. Uh, and then the kind of sequence of uh, progression, you know, continued. Uh, iron was the very next uh, kind of you know. Aha, uh -huh, right. There's a lot of iron in our body. We use iron uh, is used in our blood. It's used to develop cells. Maybe, and we also know that it can be, exist as a pure metal. So how about we try that? And, and so that, that is kind of the, the process uh, sometimes of selection and why it's, uh, it, that is very interesting that you brought that up because you know, that definitely influences the way that engineers approach these problems too. Absolutely, I completely agree with that. And uh, um, when, 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 when we're looking for metals to uh, investigate as potential biodegradable metals, we we're looking at the, uh, at the uh, concentrations that are uh, tolerable in the, in the human body. And so magnesium and iron are very high, and zinc, zinc's lower. So, so zinc's considerably lower. So people thought, well, zinc's considerably lower, maybe zinc might have some toxicity, right? But um, part of the reason why we think zinc might be lower than the other ones is because uh, it has such strong, uh, potent biological effects. And one of, the, one of those effects that we see here is this, this anti-proliferative uh, property against smooth muscle cells. So, um, uh, so, so it's not always the case that just because a, uh, a metal ion that's found in the body has a, has a, is only in a lower concentration that it might have a problem with biocompatibility. You know, the, the biological effects that it exerts, the potency it might have could be beneficial depending on the application. Mm. Well, there's so many interesting questions. I don't, I don't even know where to begin, but- um... Yeah, I can, uh, I can start by picking one out. Um, uh, here's one, uh, when you put a stent in, does it influence the strength of the wall at all? Uh, or is there any indication that there's an increased risk of aneurysm? So once, those, once the stents are, are placed, uh, a process occurs that's called remodeling. And so, you know, the, the, the tissue that your, your artery is injured in that process of implanting that stent. Uh, and naturally over time, it kind of, in a way reconfigures itself to adapt to the presence of that stent. So uh, that usually isn't a, uh, a problem at all where there's some arterial wall weakening and there's uh, aneurysms that form after that uh, for regular general stent implantations. Um, and so let's see. We have some more questions here. I'm just kind of skimming through them very quickly to pick out a couple. Uh, one interesting one here, additive manufacturing or 3D printing is useful in advancing very fast. So, uh, uh, and, and you've seen that there's been some effect on stent production. So could we comment on this a little bit? Yes, there's been some interest in using degradable metals in an additive manufacturing uh, uh, setting, right? Uh, but these materials are, are very difficult to control uh, using additive manufacturing. So it's really an active ongoing area of research right now. Uh, that's really, you know, at the, the cutting edge of, of what uh, people are trying to do currently with uh, the merging two very advanced technologies together. Um, let's see. And I'm, I'm just trying to go through questions. Feel free to chime in. Well, if you, well and um, I, I don't know if, if you... I mean, we're not, nobody here is a medical doctor, but um, there's an interesting question from Michael 
um, who had two drug eluding stents implanted in 2004 and four years later had a heart attack because a clot became trapped in one of the stents. And then he's been taking a drug. Can I ever hope to stop taking this drug? So I don't think we can answer that question, but perhaps a related question is, um, you know, maybe, you know, what is the effect of clotting relative to these three different metals that you guys have, have been um, studying so strongly, you know, iron and magnesium and zinc and, and clotting in general? Would you like to go for that, Professor Goldman, or? So we, so we, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. So we did some preliminary studies uh, looking at that with zinc, actually, because I, I did it with zinc, because so I'm a little more interested in zinc than the others. And um, we found out that when, when uh, zinc, zinc corrodes, this is actually done, uh, this, this work was done in collaboration with Dr. Megan Frost, who is the uh, chair of the, who's currently the chair of the uh, of KIPP. And, um, but at that time, at the time we did the study, she was here, she was a colleague on uh, the biomedical engineering department and she's an expert in nitric, nitric oxide. And uh, so we looked at the, um, the ability of the zinc ions to generate nitric oxide. And it turns out zinc is a very potent catalyst for generating nitric oxide from endogenous uh, uh, store, store, uh, stores of, of NO. And um, so nitric oxide is a very important uh, molecule in the blood vessels for um, key, uh, inactivating platelets. So there's a, I think zinc has, will have a strong, uh, very potent anti-platelet activity as it, as it degrades and uh, releases zinc ions, it will uh, uh, generate nitric oxide and exert a, a protective effect against platelet activation. That's my, that's my suspicion from that. And that's well, something- and, yeah, No, that, that's fascinating. And th thank you for, um, I went, I'm just gonna break out, there's a whole bunch of acronyms, but you just mentioned KIPP. So, so Dr. Megan Frost is the chair of KIPP, which stands for? Uh, kinesiology, grade of physiology which is one of the departments at Michigan Tech and where you can also earn a bachelor of science degree in. So if, if these areas are very interesting, if the medical intersection of medical and science and engineering interests you, there's two really cool majors to investigate, biomedical engineering being one of them and KIPP being another. All right, Roger, what's, what's next? Let's see. Um... Oh, uh, here's one uh, from Michael. Were there any body rejection differences seen amongst these different materials or is that not a concern? So I can take that one or Professor Goldman, you can. You had uh, uh, some good slides on uh, how the, the materials were different in their response. Uh, I don't remember which slide you're referring to, but. Oh, no problem. So, you know, a lot of the work that Professor Goldman showed uh, was kind of detailing the reaction towards these materials, you know, once we uh, put them into a, a live uh, system or a living system, and there are some big differences that we see uh, just amongst, you know, these three denominations. Uh, and, uh, and there were some nice slides he showed, if you could see, you know, when that iron wire was implanted, there's a really large neointimal formation. I have uh, it but, uh, but then when, you know, uh, zinc wire was implanted there, we didn't really get that large formation. So uh, a lot of times, you know, that, that can kind of show you or give you some hints uh, towards the uh, compatibility of the material, which uh, alludes to this uh, idea or concept of rejection and uh, rejection of maybe an implant, which is what you usually hear about, or uh, maybe a transplant too, that's different. That's an immunologic rejection reaction. Uh, but uh, here, you know, a lot of this work is studying the, uh, how these materials interact with uh, living systems. So is my screen still shared? I don't know if everyone can see my screen or not. No. no. Okay. Share again. Okay. Yeah, feel free to share again. And so, um, well, and so Daniel asks, what about something like stainless steel or titanium or boron steel? As far as the stent? So, so, yeah. so those are not, those will not be biodegradable. The stainless steel is, they're, they're currently stents made out of stainless steel, but these are, these are not biodegradable uh, metals. So we're, we're, we're competing, our biodegradable metals are competing against those. 
Well, and to, to frame that again, so stents have been around for quite a long time. I want to guess 50 years. I don't know how many years. Uh, I, I, that's a, it's just a speculation. And then came along um, the problem of restenosis from having a stent placed, which caused restenosis. And then it was really hard to fix it because there's already a stent in place. So then came along drug eluding stents. Yeah, so you have- Which a, are great, but they kill all the cells, right? They kill every cell. So Am I getting it? You're getting, you're very close. So, so it started off with just balloon angioplasty. So just the, the balloon catheter, the balloon tip catheter. And they would just um, open the balloon and break up the, the plaque. And they would hope that that would help to uh, restore health of the artery. And then restenosis occurred in like 50% of the cases. So then mm -hmm. they realized that you need to leave a stent. So then they had these, these bare metal stents. And uh, so that got you down to like 25% restenosis rates. And that was a big improvement and very exciting. Uh, but you still had uh, restenosis from intimal hyperplasia, smilosa cells. So we wanted to fight that. And that's when they started to um, um, coat, the, coat them with drugs to uh, and inhibit the proliferation of the smooth muscle cells. And that got the restenosis rates down like, like around 10% and sometimes even lower than 10%. So, um, and, and then the, the, the technology has been evolving because uh, industry realized very quickly that the uh, drug eluding, uh, drug elution was a problem. They wanted, they needed it, but they didn't want too much of it. So they want to minimize it as much as possible. The polymer coating was a problem. So now we have uh, bare metal, conventional stable metal stents with biodegradable polymer coatings. So the polymer coating dimension goes away and that's much better for biocompatibility. They have coatings that release drugs just on one side of the, of the stent, just oh, on the yeah, yeah, end yeah. of the wall. So they try to keep away from the endothelial cells. So all, all this evolution in the technology has improved the, uh, each step has improved the uh, performance of the stents. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I like the idea of doing an implant that kind of like totally goes away over time so that you don't have this architecture stuck in your heart forever, you know, I, yeah. I think it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, especially uh, clinicians that we work with that work with uh, children and there are, there, are, there are children who have congenital problems that require stents. And in, especially in those, in those people and in those uh, individuals, mm. they grow and as they grow, the stented artery doesn't grow. It, the stent actually cages the artery and mm. they end up with relative constrictions. So then, the uh, clinician has to go back in with cath balloon tip catheters and continue to, to expand those stents to keep up with the growth of the child. So you have to do that repeatedly as the child grows. So they would love to have a stent that would go in and just dis do its job quickly and disappear. And, you well, know. So, so here's, here's, here's just a question from um, a, a student out there who is interested in this area. And so what should they study in high school in order to prepare them you know, for, for pursuing perhaps a degree in biomedical engineering. Uh, Dr. Gillard, you're closer. I'm oh, uh, well, I would say in high school, you know, the, the basics are very important, you know, being very strong in chemistry, uh, math and biology. Those are really the uh, kind of the foundation of things that we study in biomedical engineering. Um, and if you have the ability to take any, um, kind of engineering uh, specialty classes in high school. Those are always great, uh, really to, to kind of teach you into uh, the, the way that engineers think. Uh, and that's from a problem solving mindset. And we use science and math uh, to problem solve. So just like this, uh, uh, this project that Professor Goldman has nicely outlined, uh, really it's a great application of some uh, basic knowledge and information about physiological systems, a little bit about chemistry, material science, to kind of solve this clinical uh, problem, this clinical need uh, that needs to be addressed. So I would, I would say for you know, a younger student, uh, definitely get, becoming strong in uh, a lot of the STEM fundamentals, you know, chemistry, biology, and math, uh, and any engineering uh, additional courses you can take would be very beneficial. All right, I'm going to take a couple of lighthearted ones while you pick a technical one to solve um, to answer Roger um, or Jeremy. So first of all, there is a Winter Carnival website, which is www.mtu.edu backslash carnival backslash 2021. So there's live Winter Carnival and you can follow along to your heart's content on what the temperature is in the area and what, what sorts of... Um, Brimball games are being played. Um, so Brimball, if you've never heard of Brimball, Brimball is played with a broom. You wear your 
boots are on the ice. There's a certain number of people who can play. I'm not sure what that number is. It's like three or four or five or something. And it's just, it's just like, be, it's like a comedy. It's like comedy on ice um, with, with desperation, you know, and passion and, you know, valor and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a hoot. It's just a hoot to watch and to participate in. I mean, you could throw yourself like full out, like, you know, I can't even describe it. It's, it's, a, it's an impressive. Uh, and so Paul asks, do they still have anonymous statues that pop up the night before judging? I don't know the answer to that, but I don't know. I don't know. You know, all I know is they're so beautiful. They're so beautiful. These are compellingly, these are architected statues with um, just immense, they're just, first of all, they're, they're, are pieces of art, and secondly, they're also feats of engineering. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, I will I will bring some, I will project some slides next time. I promise. But um, so I'm all right. I'm done with talking about Winter Carnival. And this is Winter Carnival week, where the students get Thursday and Friday off, which is awfully fun and a good break for them. I wanted to answer a question um, by a person who's from Fort Wayne. And they wanted to know what part does Fort Wayne Medals play in the stent. So um, for us, uh, Fort Wayne Medals has been a, a very uh, valuable industry collaborator. And they, they, uh, when we come up with an interesting medal that we want to evaluate in our, our RAT model, we send them, the, uh, we send them this uh, medal. Usually, I think we, we extrude rods. And then they do the a process of, of drawing wires for us, which we can't do here. So uh, they have they have great expertise at Fort Wayne Metals, and they've um, allowed us. They've made it possible for us to make uh, wire implant materials from our our um, our alloys that we've been generating. So that's the part they play uh, in our in, in our group. Roger, any questions you'd like to answer? Should we, should we talk about what form does the communication take with medical physicians concerning, concerning your research? Sure. So um, we, I, I like having uh, medical involvement at all, at all stages. So early on, I've, um, I, 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 when we, started, we first started publishing on this topic, I looked around to try to find uh, physicians that would be interested. interested. And, um, and we've been very fortunate that we have a, we have physicians at a number of places that are very interested in working with us, and their their feedback is very valuable. Um, they they contribute to um, a applications, uh, uh, helping us understand how the material, the properties of the material needs. Um, they help us. Uh, they can help if we're trying to target like a medical audience with our with the with the papers we're trying to publish. They can help us include the jargon that uh, clinicians like to see uh, to make it look like something that that they're familiar with. So uh, we 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 include them on our grants. We include them on our papers. We include them when we're thinking about projects. We talk we talk we're talking with them on a fairly regular basis. So I think I think they're 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 well they're they're well involved. So what would you say, Dr. Guillory? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. All right, so I've picked the next question from um, uh, Bob Carnahan, um, who who um, points out there's a substantial history of R and D on mag alloy orthopedic implants. You know, with that address a biocompatibility and bioabsorption rate. These rates need to be designed to match fracture healing rate while mechanically stabilizing a fracture. So these are rods that are like shoved into mm -hmm. a hip or that kind of stuff. So there would seem to be no issue of too rapid corrosion. Has there been any investigation of such magnesium alloys? Uh, sorry, you, you wanna take this Professor Goldman or? Oh, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, absolutely. There's been uh, quite uh, a lot of progression in magnesium in the orthopedic uh, sector. Uh, and one of the earliest problems with uh, uh, magnesium orthopedic use was the generation actually of uh, hydrogen gas. And uh, that was quickly remedied with, with alloying. Uh, but then the second problem kind of started to arise of uh, the mechanical properties of magnesium for you know, really severe load bearing applications. 
So, uh, but in, in spite of that, magnesium has been uh, wildly successful in the orthopedic uh, sector. There's even a, a company in Europe that has a product on the market right now uh, for uh, pins, uh, for fracture pins that will help with healing uh, certain small fractures. Uh, and they've, they've gotten a CE approval for it. Uh, there are magnesium orthopedic devices in tens of thousands of people at this point uh, around the world. And uh, the, unfortunately, they've been very successful in the orthopedic realm, but for cardiovascular use, uh, they, they still, there are some problems to work out because while the, the healing rate for uh, bone and, and fractures of this sort are uh, quite short, they're still, they're definitely not as long as uh, the uh, cardiovascular area. You know, we're talking more on the term of a year versus in the orthopedic side of things, you can be on the side of, you know, three to six months, which would be okay. Uh, but there's still, there's some suffering of mechanical properties uh, from these alloys to generate proper, uh, some proper devices, but it's still been very successful. Uh, magnesium is a widely accepted biomaterial that's uh, pretty biocompatible in certain configurations. Very good. There, there's another question I wanna take. Uh, femoral, femoral arteries are much larger than coronary arteries. Does the size of the artery affect the choice of stem material? And it definitely does. So it's well accepted now that the small diameter arteries are the ones that are uh, most, most uh, prominently plagued by the restenosis. So arteries that are about five millimeters in diameter or less are the ones that have much more complicated treatment, treatment options. So the coronary arteries fall into that category and the uh, larger arteries, they're a completely different market. So there's a coronary artery market and then there's the peripheral artery uh, market and uh, they're the stents that are designed uh, with very different uh, properties and, and uh, benchmarks in mind for the different for the different arteries. So I don't want to don't want, yeah. So the, the, the peripheral artery uh, environment is not nearly as challenging as the current artery environment. So that's like the drug eluding stents are more more prominently uh, selected for the uh, coronary arteries. Well, and so maybe we. You could you discuss the question of aluminum? Is aluminum a, a, a potential alloy to consider, considering it's it's lightweight? So, for implants? so we actually had an early alloy with zinc, uh, adding aluminum to zinc, and it made the mechanical properties really nice. There was some problem with the corrosion behavior, but um, the the main issue with aluminum is that it uh, it's a biocompatibility and it shows up in. I think it's I think it's Alzheimer's. I think it's Alzheimer's or one of one of these one of the brain diseases. It's either Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. I don't know which one, but one of them, aluminum, shows up very prominently in the uh, in the brain. And mm. so and there's there's so there's a um, a controversy in the scientific community about whether the aluminum is a, is causing that or aluminum accumulates because there's a problem. But generally, people try to avoid aluminum because of this bi this this uh, perceived biocompatibility issue. I don't remember exactly which disease I'm, it was. I'm just going to say, this gives me ammunition because my husband loves to cook by wrapping things in foil wrap. And I keep, I keep saying, don't do it. You know, and so I'm just going to quote you on this, Jeremy. I'm just going to, this is going to become a marital issue. Don't quote me because I'm, I'm, one of the, I'm one of those who thinks aluminum is fine, not a problem. Because if you, you can, uh, uh, aluminum is very rapidly excreted. So if you inject, like say, rats with aluminum, they, they get rid of it very quickly. So I think it is just, just you know, a disease related uh, breakdown of the ability to to detoxify that eventually uh, all right so, so if he if he drinks enough okay. water then it's okay for him as long as he's <laughs> not, 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 not holding on the toxins in his body yeah this is this is a hotly debated issue in the in the field actually oh yeah. gosh well um <laughs> no this is funny um and it's alzheimer's uh walt okay. lange uh, points out that um yeah. Where aluminum is a candidate guess, for that. Right. <laughs> well, I've heard. I think I've heard that too. I haven't followed it lately. You know, like relative to the latest information. And then Walt also pointed out that um, Michigan Tech used to give some sort of Sammys for the one nighters, a great award. Although some of the statues were of the iffy variety. I, you know, and I. I don't know. That was a long time ago. But I do want to acknowledge. He points out that Blue Key um, has helped. Tech put on the carnival for many, many years, and they still do. And so, um, Winter Carnival is just a hugely fun thing here, and uh, made possible from Blue Key. So, 
Um, all right, any last questions to take? Someone wants to know oh. about the manufacturing process for- Yeah, I was just gonna mention that one. You wanna go, go ahead and take it then, so. Um, uh, sure, you know, this is in, an also an open area of research. Uh, definitely the manufacturing process could uh, impart some changes uh, ultimately in the, the final compatibility of materials. So uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't have to say much more than that, uh, but this is a definitely a great mention uh, and it's something that's being considered too. Yeah. So yeah, typically the conventional stents are manufactured by, um, by, by a tube drawing process, followed by the laser cutting into the stent pattern. So, but there are other ways of manufacturing stents. I've seen uh, um, braided stents. So you can actually uh, make stents from wires that are, that are fused together. And uh, so, which I think it might be interesting since we, implant wires into rats, it's kind of, we get a criticism all the time that, well, stents aren't made of wires, right? But actually there are some stents that are made of wires. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is true, it's true. All right, so um, I guess um, there's, there's a few remaining questions, but um, are, is there anything that jumps out to you? Well, Mike, Mike just asked, how's the cross-country skiing been this season? So I'll, I'll answer that. Um, it's been okay. It's been actually pretty good. We had um, one weekend, the tech trails were closed. They're back open. Um, snow is always really good here because the temperature stays low. Uh, so there's enough, there's enough. Um, it's not superb, but it's, 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 it's pretty darn good. We've been, we always go cross country skiing with the dogs. Well, and perhaps a closing question and maybe an inspirational point would be, you know, you guys have been working on products to help improve um, heart health, right? Heart, heart longevity, um, human longevity um, across your, you know, past decade. And so, you know, like, what are your personal exercise practices? And uh, and uh, we were talking about that when we got started, Jeremy. So you mentioned your daughter dragged you dragged you what away from your office and made you start running, and now you're running. No, no, out of my bed in the morning. <laughs> she was very serious. She was like a drill sergeant. <laughs> it's yeah. important, right? Yeah. No, I, ha I have very good environment for, for, for health. My wife is into organic food and very good nutrients and uh, very good diet. So my diet is really fantastic. And then I had my daughter whipping me in the shape. And uh, you know, she can do 10 times as many push-ups as I can. So we're competing to, you know, so... Um, good. So yeah, I have a good environment for fostering good cardio health. Well, and Roger, you mentioned that you also are a runner and you ran and you exercised and you're, mm -hmm. you're going to keep doing that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, you really, you kind of have to change your mindset a little bit and in order to be successful with it, you know, you can't think of it as more work. You have to think of it as, you know, a necessary part uh, of your life, you know, really, truly uh, changing the way you kind of behave, you know, and changing your pattern of behavior. So that really helps because then, you know, when you have to wake up and, and exercise in the morning, or if you have to go for a run, you know, three or four or five mile run, you know, you don't won't think of it as, oh, this is just another thing I have to do. Uh, but, you know, try to find something that you do that you can really enjoy. Tech is great for that. You know, you can find a lot of things that you can do uh, outside that, if you enjoy, you know, really good for your health. There's a lot of hiking, uh, skiing, you know, the running here is beautiful, absolutely amazing uh, and gorgeous places to run. So there's tons of stuff you can do to kind of nicely incorporate it in your lifestyle. And we have the cleanest air on earth, apparently. Like there's signs that say <laughs> that up here. So, well, um, so I cannot thank you both enough. I learned um, so much. I, I never understood, um, some of the some of these aspects, even though I actually had a biomedical startup company of my own with braided metal wire stents, uh, yeah. I, I you put some pieces together for me, um, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roger, for co-hosting this and for being one of our faculty members now here at Michigan Tech. So um, thank you, everyone. It's been wonderful to feel as though you're all with us here for the week of Winter Carnival and. Um, 
We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Awesome.